You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Faith, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney, and Snarky Faith is radio for the spiritually disenfranchised. If you've had enough of the insanity in Christianity, you have come to the right place. Here at Snarky Faith, we're all about finding a sane faith grounded in reality and working to make the world a better place in tangible ways. This is not a zone for spiritual escapism. Sunday School Answers are Christianese. We're here to call out religious BS and look for better ways forward. And if you can handle your conversations about faith with copious amounts of sarcasm and also a little bit of this, then you've come to the right place. Welcome home. On today's show, we're going to talk about being the odd man out and why that's a spot you need to be in your faith. But before we descend into the snark, just a reminder that this broadcast and all past podcasts can be found at www.snarkyfaith.com and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Amazon, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube. We're here, we're there, we're everywhere. Just look for Snarky Faith. And if you like the show, make sure to share and subscribe. I'd appreciate it. And also one thing I got to toss out to you guys is we've got the makings of a snarky faith snack, a snack, snack store. It's not a snack store. It's a swag store. It's a swag store. If I can get that out of my mind. Yes, we've got a merchandise store. If you want to go over and check it out, look on snarkyfaith.com and you just click swag and it'll take you to some of the sweet products that we're cranking out here. If you need a t-shirt, a mug or something of that like. Now, I don't know about you, but I missed you all. Did you miss me last week when we didn't have a show? Did you, did you, did you? Well, I did get some messages from people being like, where's the show? Where's the show? And I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. I took a week off just for some brain space, just for some life space. And now I'm back and I'm ready to go. How about you? You ready for some more snarky faith? Well, if you're not... It's going to be a very long show for you. (laughs) So, all right, all right. We've got a lot packed in for the show this hour. I actually wanted to start off with this. Something I found over in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And because, again, who isn't reading the St. Louis Post-Dispatch on a regular basis? But I do appreciate their editorial board because they wrote this, which I feel like is a good place to start today. The editorial article is called Calling Out So-Called Prophets Who Miscalled Trump's Election Victory. What? That's what we do here on a regular basis. Well done, St. Louis Post-Dispatch. So I'm going to read a little bit of this because it reads very, very well. It reads very, very well of the message that we try to get across here week after week, and I love it. I love it. The article begins with this. Evangelical groups are calling their own preachers to task for a spate of so-called prophecies. Nearly all in support of far-right political causes and former President Donald Trump. That never came to pass. Prominent pastors are wisely urging their colleagues to commit to a standards of prophecy that reject the mixing of personal political beliefs with what they claim to be divine inspiration. Editorially, we try to avoid opining about religious faith. But invoking divine guidance to advance partisan causes smacks of the worst kind of manipulation, opening the door to abuse and financial exploitation. Pentecostal and charismatic Christian leaders have laudably begun insisting that the false prophets amongst them cease and desist. The article continues saying this, um, and I love this part. All it takes is a cheap website or YouTube posting for charlatans to gain a global following. One Pickneyville, Illinois preacher who claims followers across North and South America posted a YouTube prophecy in May declaring that Trump would be reinstalled on the White House on July 4th. Of course, it was nonsense. But such quackery can be deadly dangerous, such as when protesters claiming divine inspiration joined in storming the Capitol on January 6th, the, quote, Jericho March co-founder Rob 
Weaver was amongst the preachers who claimed divine guidance in directing followers to towards Capitol Hill. And what they're also posting, which is hilarious, that someone has come out too with this. This is what I love about this. this there's a propheticstandards.com. Propheticstandards.com. Like squished all together. <laughs> and it's a website that literally is coming a we believe in prophetic standards. Uh, and it's, yes, yes, best practices for prophets, which is hilarious. And I'm not sure if that really strikes at the heart of our problem, but it's a, it's, it's a move in the right direction of holding these charlatans to task. So in lieu of getting people to f sign prophetic standard statements, what we like to do here on, on Snarky Faith is, ah, we just do public mockery. That's also a very effective manner of doing it in a segment that we love to call the Christian Crazy of the Week, where we roast the choicest cuts of Christian nuts. It's the Christian Crazy of the Week. And let's go ahead and get to it. If loving the Lord is wrong, I don't want to be right. Lord have mercy. The Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. <laughs> So it wasn't by any chance that I was talking about the fact that we need to have pro prophetic standards with our prophets here, right? In our faith, we need to have some prophetic standards. Because come on, come on. We can't just take your word from it if you're a prophet. We need to have some sort of standards and checklists. I mean, what is this, the Wild West, where anyone can declare themselves a prophet or an apostle in the faith? Oh, they do. They already do that. That's right. I forgot that. Hmm. Well, all right. All right. So here we go with King of BS, Hank Kuhneman. Prophet Hank Kuhneman telling you guys that, hey, 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 he is a real prophet. And here's why he's a prophet. And he's going to prove it to you with stories that only he can prove. Because that's how it works in this kind of tornado of bullshit. Years ago, I was uh, right over there. Um, we had a guest speaker at the time, Ed Dufresne. He gets up. He never endorsed anybody as, as standing in, in an office of a prophet. And he, 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 he starts preaching. He says, Jesus, I see that. He says, this man, talking about your pastor, is called as a prophet to this nation but the nations. We had one time Jesus appeared in our church, stood on the stage. I told the church about it. And, uh, you know, some people didn't believe it. And two weeks later, a, a woman comes. This is before the days of the Internet. And she says, why is Jesus standing right here? She announced the exact place that I saw the vision. She described exactly what Jesus was wearing, exactly what he was holding, just like I told the church. And she says, and Jesus says to this man right here, she, this is two powerful things she said, this man and woman are called in the office to be prophets to the nation and the nations of the earth. And then she said, and anyone that touches them are going to be exposed and they'll be like the dust of the wind, and they'll blow away and be no more. Wow, that is incredible. A guy said a thing, and then Hank saw a thing that no one, not, not everybody believed in, but then another lady before the internet, who we don't know her name, said, there's Jesus, and I'm going to talk about his clothes. Oh, also, Hank is the guy you should always listen to and make sure you give your money to. What? <laughs> This. I love it. I love it. Hank, Hank, this is why we need the official prophetic standard statement, because otherwise you just keep making stuff up. It works. It works. But what? But what? What kind of insanity is? Oh, it's your kind of Hank sanity. Got it. Got it. What was I thinking? And now, oh, heavens, no. The wrath of God shall come down upon me. I'm actually really just curious, like, what kind of clothes is Jesus wearing? Like, is he doing, like, was this, like, stereotypical Jesus clothes? Like, the white robe? Like, was it white Jesus? Was it, like... Jewish Jesus, Middle Eastern Jesus. You know, what are we? Come on. Come on, Hank. There was Jesus in his clothes. That, seriously, we're going to need a police sketch artist, and we're never going to catch this guy ever again with that kind of description, Hank. It's just not going to work. You know what's also not working? Pastor Rodney Howard Brown. Right, right. Rodney Howard Brown has been a big voice against COVID in general, vaccinations especially. But now at this point, I mean, listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to what he's going to go. He's going to go off one of his rants. He's just getting lazy now. 
That's, that's the thing. The prophets are just getting lazy now. And that's the sad thing you don't want to, you don't want to see. Like, if I'm gonna hear prophecies, come on. Put a little shock and awe in them. Put a little creativity into it. Come on. At least a small amount of effort. A scotch. Just a teeny bit of effort. You can do it, Rodney. You can do it. Not here you do it, but I believe you can do better than this. You vaccinate yourself, shoot up all you want to. I, listen, people are smoking weed and sniffing, snorting cocaine. Do whatever. But just because you do it doesn't mean to say you have to force anybody else to do it. There's no way that an unvaccinated person who has a healthy immune system is going to be spreading any virus. It doesn't work that way. It, 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 that's not how it spreads. It spreads from people that are infected and that are sickly. <sighs> I mean, that was low energy. I really don't know what he's going after here because, I mean, he does have some sound logic. If you're not sick, you can't spread sickness. If you are sick, you can spread sickness. Is that how it happens? People that are sick are sick. People that are not sick are not sick. And <laughs> But apparently, Rodney doesn't care whether you get a vaccination or if you're out sniffing cocaine because they're the same in his mind. Oh, goodness, that's no help for us out there. Because you know what? The Delta variant and COVID keeps getting worse. But what can we do? Not what can we do against the virus, but what can we do? I've been thinking about this. What can we do if we've accidentally gotten vaccinated and God isn't happy with it? I mean, it's the mark of the beast after all. It's, it's toxic. It's horrible. It's a control structure. It's in my body. What do I do? Uh, what do I do with this vaccine that's protecting me from getting sick? Ah, <laughs> I want to be in the hospital, I guess. I don't know. But someone does have an answer for you. Someone does have an answer for you. Robin Bullock. He's here to fix your very specific quandary. Here's how he's going to do it. Now, I heard something very different right now, very significant right now. And this is just what I'm going to say about it. There are some who, who took that vaccine. And you are, you are very concerned whether you will live or whether you will die. As time takes its toll, the Lord said, reach out to me today and I'll neutralize its effects inside your bloodstream today. Reach out now and call on his name for neutralization is being given. That's a good one. That's a good one. Dear Lord, please unprotect me and neutralize this protection that I have within myself so that I can... What? This is nuts. This is absolutely friggin' nuts. But you are in a section called the Christian Crazy, so it's all par for the course. Yes, yes. So lastly, we've got Pastor Kent Christmas. Now, don't let his name fool you, because <laughs> he's not as much fun as a fat, jolly guy. He's more like the guy that wants to put coal in your stockings year-round if he can. Because Kent says God's angry, and he's not going to take it anymore. 2020, God spoke to me, said Donald Trump. In fact, in 2015, he spoke to me, said Donald Trump would become president. Did not look possible. He became president. Most of us thought that he would become president again this time, and he was. He won it by about 80 million votes. But the issue is more than this. This is not about politics. If we reduce it to politics, then we are missing what God is wanting to do. This is about releasing the gospel of Jesus Christ with signs and wonders and miracles. If there ever was an hour that we need an apostolic release of the Holy Ghost. And the spirit of cancer is a plague in this nation. 
And as God begins to release the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord, he is raising up men and women that have authority in the Holy Ghost. We're not just your average believer who does know how to pray and how to touch the throne room of God. But the Lord says, I am raising up an army in this hour that cannot be defeated, that is shaking off the enemy, shaking off the snake by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Lord said, I am putting a shout back in the house of the Lord. Get ready, says God, for there's an apostolic army of angels that's being released in the atmosphere. So yes, 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 yes. This isn't about politics. This is really about God releasing the gospel of Christ onto the country through signs and wonders and yada, yada, yada. We're awesome. We're great. We're the best Christians. We know how to do it better than anyone else. We like to get touchy in God's throne room. Touch, touch, way. I don't even know where he's going with any of this, this, this load of crap here. My point being all of this. It'd be easy to go after the fact that, yeah, he's obsessed with Trump. Yeah, he's continuing to spew election lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's too easy. That's too easy. My point is this. With, with a lot of these, these, these so-called prophets, does, doesn't God look like the most impotent little bitch when we hear these guys talking? Now, I'm sure they'll say God will, with wrath and anointing and destroy and da-da-da-da-da. But isn't it kind of weird? Like, the oh, God's anointed was elected, but it was stolen from him. And God was like, hmm. And then all of these things are happening in the nation. And God's like, hmm, I need to have men or women do my job of being an a-hole to everybody else. Hmm. Doesn't God seem like the biggest little bitch the way they talk about it? Like, we need something for God to move. We need this for God to have. Well, why? if God's good, why doesn't God just do it? Oh, because that's not how God works. Oh, this isn't really the Santa Claus God, even though we mentioned Kent Christmas not being like Santa Claus. We want God to be like Santa Claus, to give us what we want and to hate those that we hate. Got it. Is that the Christian message nowadays? It really seems like it. It does. So all that insanity, all that bad theology, all that charlataning, charlatanery. Not really sure what the, <laughs> the correct description of what they do. Charlatanism? I'm not really sure. I'm, okay, that's not my point. Not my point. We made it through. We made it through. We made it through the crazy. And, and we've made it to the other side of the Christian crazy just for me to be able to tell you this. Hey, guess what else is happening in the world today? The next God's Not Dead movie is coming out. It's going to focus on freedom of speech and religious liberties. Woo! Yeah! The movie that no one was asking for is, is, has come out. And we're so pumped and excited. So pumped and excited. We should actually do this. I've talked about this for a little while that we should probably have. And if anyone wants this, reach out to me. Questions at snarkyfaith.com. Doing some sort of a, 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 uh, like a Netflix party or a viewing party where we can go through God's Not Dead. I think that could be fun. I think that could be snarky and fun. If anyone's interested, hit me up. Yeah. But again, one thing that we do know that we can learn from the God's Not Dead series is it's kind of a, as they come out, it's really a a forecast of where a lot of the religious right are existing in this moment. So this movie is about freedom of speech, <gasps> religious liberties. <gasps> it's the fourth movie, the fourth friggin' movie in this crappy series. Yes, it does continue on. Why? Because Christianity is in a bizarre place where Christianity has kind of forgotten why it existed and it's really become more about personal comfort, personal preference, <laughs> and it has nothing to do with walking out the ways of Jesus. It has nothing to do with serving those in the community. It has nothing to do with compassion or grace or any of those things. No, no, no. It's all just about me, 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 me. What do I want? Well, I need freedom of speech so I can go out. Yeah. You know the drill. And if this didn't even put a cherry on top, Judge Jeanine Pira from Fox News actually stars in this movie. So you know they have brought in the top shelf people when they're bringing in Fox News nutter butters as actors in this fine piece of cinematic garbage. I'm already going to go ahead and call it. I'm calling it now. I'm calling it now. If I'm wrong, you can make me eat my words and make me watch this film, but I've already seen the preview. I've already seen the acting abilities. I already kind of know where we're going to go with this one. So 
Is this, are we talking about God's Not Dead today? No, we're not. No, we're not. But what I do want to take is kind of a bit of like, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a walk through some different headlines and kind of take a bit of a temperature as to where a lot of Christianity is today, especially here in America. We know there's the prophets profiting off of dumb people because people, listen, this is the whole idea. Like on the internet, you know, you're not supposed to feed the trolls. So guess what? Don't fund the prophets. If they don't have money, they can't keep going. See, see, that's the easiest way to do this. It's kind of like profit condoms. Just don't give them money and they won't reproduce. That's just how it works. So staying on topic, God's Not Dead is telling us that Christianity is worried about freedom of speech and religious liberties right now. So that is a priority of the faith in certain circles. Then I was reading another article over on Religion News Service. And, and the overall focus of the article is not really what I'm going to focus on, but the focus of the article was about the death of Nashville, one of Nashville's uh, megachurch pastors, staff pastors, Chris Swain. So this has really nothing to do with Chris Swain. May God rest his soul and be with his family as they grieve. My point isn't about him, but it was about how the article was written about the church. And I found this very interesting. So, and it, it begins like this. It says, for the past seven months, Long Hollow Baptist Church has been a place of miracles and wonder. Like many congregation, Long Hollow has experienced a downturn due to COVID-19, and in December of 2020, it had the lowest attendance since Rob uh, Gallery arrived as pastor in 2015. Since then, in what the church leaders call a revival, the Southern Baptist congregation has baptized 1,361 people, seen crumbling marriages restored, and lives that were falling apart turned around. Okay, so what they are talking about this is, is a time of miracles and wonders. So this church is saying, where, where it's at is miracles and wonders, and so the church is all about miracles and wonders, and to them, that metric is baptisms. I'm not really sure how you're seeing crumbling marriages restored and lives that were falling apart turned around, but Hey, miracle, miracle, miracle. Again, we're, we're seeing how, how modern-day churchianity is able to navigate through their metrics of what it means to be a good church and to be a successful church. And for them, it means miracles and wonders, and how they define it is baptisms and lives that were falling apart turned around, whatever that means. Now, again, I'm not downplaying the work that they're doing there, but you're also able to see this, that... that I really think about this. I think that within Christianity, what we celebrate and what we brag about and what we get excited about says a lot about where our heart is. It says a lot about where we are at. And so for a church, and I know, I know you may be saying that, Stuart, you're nitpicking this. But again, when churches, when we see churches that are, that are praising things like this, like baptisms. Again, there's nothing wrong with baptism at all. I'm not anti-baptism, but, but, but baptism is a very, very, very Sunday morning centric kind of a thing where we try to usher people down. We try to get people saved and we try to get people dipped. And so what we're seeing is they've learned this church amongst many others. This is, this is very common has learned that their highest highs of ministry only surround that Sunday morning type of experience because that's just how we function. We are simply a program. We are a product. And so that's what they celebrate, okay? That's, that's what matters to them, which again, we're just taking a litmus test of many things here, right? So again, we're worried about religious liberty, freedom of speech, or, or, or we're over here celebrating miracles and wonders, which I'm not even really sure are miracles and wonders, but either way, we've got to Christianize them. So moving on to another article, which I found very interesting. And the next one is over at the, it's at the Christian Post. An article called Moody's Edwin Lutzer warns church is capitulating to, to ungodly ideas and being shamed into silence. The article's by Lee Marianne Kelt. The article talks about this. Influential pastor and radio broadcaster Erwin Lutzer is on a mission to reclaim the church for Christ. He fears, uh, a church he fears is increasingly capitulating to the ideas and worldviews that are antithetical to the gospel of Christ. Okay. 
Maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay, let's, okay, so let's continue on. What, 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 is, what does he have to say? Instead of allowing scripture to stand alone, we interpret it in a way that is consistent with the culture. I want Christians, uh, I want to challenge Christians. Will we interpret culture through the lens of scripture or we interpret scripture through the lens of culture? Which, which uh, he's bringing up a point that I think many people would nod their heads at like, hmm, preach it, brother, this is interesting. My bigger question to this is, it's an absolutely idiotic statement. So how does one interpret anything outside of culture? Because you were born into a certain culture, whether it be a larger, like a culture based on your country, like an American culture, or a, uh, the culture in Mexico or Canada or Australia. You have, you have kind of your nationalistic culture. Then you have, you have your, your smaller ones too, like that are what, what makes up your community. And all of that, all of that goes into, to, really framing and focusing the lens that we look at life through. So this idea that we can somehow like, oh no, we need to let scripture speak to itself and pull all of this culture out of it and away from us. Well, that's, that's an idiotic statement and it's really just a bad reading of theology because first of all, scripture, scripture was influenced by the culture at the time because the authors of scripture were immersed in their own scripture, in their own times, and they had their own biases and opinions, just like we do today. So when we read scripture, we're reading through the lens of someone that wrote this before, and through what they were trying to get across in the situation they were in, and we read it into our personal context right now in 2021. So it's impossible for us to read scripture without putting it through the lens of our culture. And, and this ends up being one of these stupid rallying points for a lot of the religious right, that we have somehow capitulated ourselves to culture. Well, it's going to just get better from here. Uh, Lutzer also said this, the church is being shamed into silence because we don't know what to say. We fear we will be misunderstood and vilified. But so many things have changed in America that we can no longer take for granted all of the freedoms and all of the acceptance that we've generally enjoyed. We're in a new day. So the article says in his book, the pastor tackles hot, topic, hot button topics such as propaganda, sexualization of children, socialism, critical race theory. And why did he write the book? Well, Lutzer said he had a growing concern that the radical left in America does not believe that America can be fixed and has to be destroyed and rebuilt on cultural Marxism. So he doesn't like the way culture's moving and he's going to tell us to like lean in towards his culture, the culture he believes is right, because in his culture, in his group, in his tribe, they say the Bible is God's word. You just read it, you read it, and that's what God says, which, which is asinine. And is a terrible, terrible, terrible way to approach Scripture. But, 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 in this, we are seeing across the board with a lot of American Christianity what people are consumed with. Well, people within the industrial complex of Christianity, i.e. the ones that are the money brokers, the power brokers, those that are on stage, those. So, God's not dead. Told us we're worried about freedom of speech. What does that mean? It means Christians want to be able to be a-holes and say whatever they want to with zero consequence. Next, we realize that churches don't really know how to celebrate really what is a proper win that would be a win that we would say would make sense with the gospel of Christ. They understand what a win is in churchianity, but they really don't know what a win is based on the gospel. Then we moved over to Moody to talk about the fact of uh, Christians are still trying to war against culture. And we're going to be talking a lot about that today. One of the broken parts of culture where we divide these things into this is secular, this is sacred, and never shall the two meet. Yep. But before we get to that, I had to go through this nugget over at the Washington Times. The Washington Times had a opinion piece by Everett Piper called America's New Religion, Fake Christianity. Yeah, the tagline, stop calling yourself a Christian if you don't believe in Christ. 
That's actually a really loaded statement. What does it mean to believe in Christ? Does it mean to follow after Christ? Does it mean that I believe that Christ existed? Does it mean I believe that Christ is the son of God? Does it mean whatever, whatever? No, no, no. That's just Christianese are throwing at us. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in him? As much as I believe in Kraft macaroni and cheese. Yeah, they're things. They exist. We can believe in things that are there. Boop. There's the thing. Yeah. But let me quote directly from the article. Earlier this month in the Western Journal, the Western Journal reported that the American church has fallen. Shocking polls shows fake Christianity has supplanted the biblical worldview. Writing for the journal, Rachel Bratton said this, American Christianity has fallen thanks to cultural corrosion, a lack of bi biblical literacy, a new fake Christianity is now being preached within the American church. This counterfeit religion is moralistic therapeutic deism which is a worldview that has quickly gained prominence and given many Americans a theological a theology that looks nothing like historical Christianity, despite what they may claim. And then she goes on to cite the recent work of George Barna, whose February survey showed that the moralistic therapeutic deism, MTD, or watered-down feel-good fake Christianity, is the most popular worldview in the United States today. So this then they're quoting from this article from uh, Mr. Barna. So he says that Christianity, is, is, Christianity in this nation is rotting from the inside out. MTD is essentially what I would call fake Christianity because it has some Christian elements in it, but it's not really biblical. It's not really Christian. What is MTD exactly? Well, Barna answers. The moralistic perspective is we're here to be good people and to try to do good. The therapeutic aspect is everything is supposed to be geared towards making me feel good about myself, ultimately to make me happy. And deism is the idea that God created the world but has no direct involvement in it. Basically, according to MTD, there is a distant God who wants everyone to be nice and the purpose of life is to be happy. So Bart is pushing back on this idea, saying that we, I've heard this before, the feel-good gospel, the easy gospel, the gospel of grace, grace, <laughs> Gross, gross. Ugh. Yeah, really, that's what happens. Is the idea that 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 the table of Christ, that the gospel of Christ, that the kingdom of God has a door open, saying that we have room for all of you. Christians don't like that, and even though I know Barna is saying is they've moved away from historic Christianity. Well, what is that even? If you look over historic Christianity, historic Christianity is constantly changing. It isn't like a set point in history. It isn't a monolith. It constantly changes. It changes with what? Culture. What? What culture? It changes with culture? Yeah, it does. It changes over time. Technology has changed. The world has changed. The world has gotten smaller as we've had more people on this earth. We change through what we learn, through what we live, through our perspective, through our culture, through our education, and, and, and what we are learning. So this idea that somehow the word of God is, is etched in time and is never changing because we read it in the Bible, which, by the way, is translated. Depending upon your translation, it's a translation from another translation. It could even be a translation from another translation after that. So to just simply say we just read the word of God is stupid. We have to have other people translate it, put it through their opinions, their scholarship, their understanding, and their cultural biases. And then it ends up in pages of a Bible that are written in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where we get. And, and my point for bringing all this together here is this idea that Christianity for the longest time, when I say for the longest time, I say my lifetime and beyond. I'm sorry, I'm saying in America, I'm trying to think from around the time of probably around the 50s and 60s when we began to see the rise of the religious right uh, and, and the moral majority as it began to gain steam. We, we have seen this throughout history, especially even moving towards how, how we even have in God we trust on our money. See that? You know what that was? That was a push from culture. That was a push from culture. It was a push from cultural nationalism that pushed us, that pushed conservative beliefs on American identity. Yep. Yep. So which part of this is, is not acquiescing to culture? Which part of this is, is just reading the Bible and doing what the Bible says? None of it. None of it 
None of it. We have to process it. Hopefully, we wrestle it out together in community. But either way, all this that we've been talking about, all of these notions of protecting things, protecting rights, protecting historic Christianity, pr protecting our preferences, none of this, none of this, none of this has anything to do with Christianity. None of it. These are all distractions. These are all distractions from doing the simple work of Christ. And, and I mentioned this earlier, and I want to use this, and this is, <laughs> I wanted to get a good definition. I, 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 want, I want to read through some of this here. Um, and, and so going through, talking about the difference between secular and sacred things, because I think, I think that we have, we have lost something when we begin to put boundaries on saying, this is holy, this is good, but this over here is bad and it is not holy and good, that this space in the world or this person in the world or this conversation is inherently bad, but this one over here is inherently good. See, when we fall into these weird, weird, weird binaries, it's, 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 it's actually just intellectually lazy. Culturally easy, intellectually lazy. But as, as a primer for this conversation too, let, let's, let's dangle into this. Let's go to uh, Madeline Lingle, who said there's nothing more so... There is nothing so secular that it cannot be made sacred. And that is one of the deepest messages of the incarnation. I continue to come back to this one, that there is nothing so secular that cannot be made sacred. That that is one of the deepest messages of the incarnation. And the other one that grabs me is Wendell Berry. He says, there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. And, and one of the things that we try to do here on a regular basis on the show, whether we do it <laughs> well or not, that's, that's up for opinion, but is, is beginning to untangle God from this religious BS that we have inherited, this religious BS that we are surrounded in, this, the, the cultures of religious BS. As much as they like to talk about, oh, the common culture is evil, I would probably say this religious culture that we live with in America, especially being a person that lives in the Bible Belt, that 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 is evil. Why? Well, why? Because it, it presumes nation, nation is as good as God, and that God blesses this nation above others. That's just, that's just selfish. That's just narcissistic, actually. Christian nationalism is narcissism, and it makes sense because their orange messiah was the pretty good definition of narcissism in itself. But I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to focus on that too much today. What I want to do is I want to start to talk about how we need to learn to be different. And we need to learn to own our own uniqueness and our own oddities. Now, um, one thing I, I, want, I, want to, I want to inject into this conversation. So I was trying to look up, uh, I was looking for words uh, to describe the difference between secular and sacred. I actually found this. <laughs> On a very, very, very simplistic website. Uh, it's differencebetween.com. What does it do? It shows the difference between words. Ah! Um, but I like this. They would said this uh, about secular on here, defining secular. Uh, all things that are not holy are called secular. This means that things not specifically meant to be used in church or in connection to God are secular things. Now, the problem with us, this is back to me, this is back to Stuart. The problem with us is that we like to go around labeling things secular and sacred. And it is not our job to do that. It is not our job at all to call that out. It's our job to go into all spaces because if you want to talk about historic Christianity, historic Christianity would say, okay, God is the creator of all in the world. And if God created it, it's inherently good. It has purpose. So humans, others that live around us are made in the image of God, but also creation. Creation is made by the thumbprint of God too. So where can we go where God isn't? Where can we go where God's creation isn't? Simply put, nowhere. Nowhere. So this idea that there's a divide between secular and sacred is foolishness. It's absolute foolishness. And it's a thing that's been created by power brokers within the church to continue to be able to hold control over us because, because they are able to say, don't go there, you can go here. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. Control structure. Simple control structure. But I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to tell you is, oh, that's BS. It's all crap. It's nothing that we need. 
It's nothing healthful. It's nothing that, that will help you live out your life. What I would want to do is I want to focus on you and your uniqueness. And your uniqueness is a beautiful thing because your uniqueness, the way God created you in your own, own, own specific way, it's beautiful. It's you. And we need to learn to embrace that. And we also need to work on embracing our roles within the faith. Now, I don't, I don't mean embracing a role as, as in like, I'm a good churchgoer. No, no, no. Like embracing the postures that, that we need to have to follow after Christ. Because I feel like through a lot of the stuff we've talked about so far, it seems like we have lost that. We have a bunch of people in the faith telling us exactly how, how to be. Uh, we're supposed to be just like our pastor. We're supposed to model our lives after these people that are knowledgeable Bible teachers that, that shove their knowledge onto us every week. No, no, I, I don't think that God wants us to go through a, a homogenization factory where we are all the same. And when you look across a, across a lot of the Christian landscape, it seems like churches are teaching a lot of sameness. And one author that in particular that, that really got me through some formative years that I would actually say probably kicked me into my deconstruction many, many, many years back uh, is Mike Iaconelli. Mike Iaconelli was a, a voice to youth pastors back in the, what is it, like 90s and, and early 2000s before his death. And I have a book of, it's like of just, comp, it's a compilation of his blogs and writings that he would put out there. And this one is back from January of 2002. So that'll make some of the references a little dated. But I think you're smart enough to be able to roll with this. And so I, I want to read this post and use it as a launching off post uh, point for us to really be able to dig in deeper into our conversation. So the post is entitled this, The Truth Shall Make You Odd. What characterizes Christianity in the modern world is oddness. Christianity is a home for people who are out of step, unfashionable, unconventional, and countercultural. As Peter wrote, Strangers and Aliens. I pastor the slowest growing church in America. We started 12 years ago with 90 members, and we have now ungrown to 30. We're about as far as you can get from a user friendly church. Not because our congregation is unfriendly, but because our services are unpredictable, unpolished, and inconsistent. We are an odd, friendly church attracting unique and different followers of Christ who make every service a surprise. We refuse to edit oddness and incompetence from our service. We believe in odd, that oddness matters. We want our services filled with mistakes and surprises because life is full of mistakes and surprises. One Sunday morning, during the time for prayer requests, a member began describing the critical illness of her father. Because she was close to her father, her request for prayer was frequently interrupted by her own tears. Those around her reached out a hand and nodded with sadness. Some found their eyes filled with tears as well. The woman finished her request as best she could. Seated on the front row was Sadie, a young woman with Down syndrome. Sadie stood up and walked up the aisle until she saw the woman in the middle of her row. row. Stepping over the feet of other people in the aisle, Sadie reached the woman bent down on her knees and laid her head in the woman's lap and cried with her. Sadie inconvenienced an entire row of people, stepped on their shoes and forced them to make room for her. But none of us will ever forget that moment. Sadie is still teaching the rest of us what the odd compassion of Christ's church looks like. Someone once said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you odd. Whoever made that statement understood what it means to be a follower of Christ. Followers of Christ are odd. Oddness is important because that's the quality that adds color, texture, variety, and beauty to the human condition. Christ doesn't make us the same. What he does is affirm our differentness. Oddness is important because the most dangerous word in the Western culture is sameness. Sameness is a virtue that infects members of industrialized nations. It causes an allergic reaction to anyone who's different. This virus affects the decision-making parts of our brains, results in an obsession with making choices identical to those everyone else is making. Sameness is a disease with disastrous consequences. Differences are ignored. Uniqueness is not listened to. Gifts are canceled out. 
and the places where life, passion, and joy reside are snuffed out. Sameness is the result of sin. Sin does much more than infect us with lust and greed. It flattens the human race. It franchises us. It attempts to make us all homogenous. Sameness is a cemetery where our distinctiveness is dead. In the sea of sameness, no one has an identity. But Christians do have an identity. Aliens. We're the odd ones, the strange ones, the misfits, the outsiders, the incompatibles. Oddness is a gift from God that sits dormant until God's spirit gives it life and shape. Oddness is the consequence of following the one who made us unique, different, and in her image. May our ministries be homes of oddness, the places where differentness is encouraged and sameness is considered sin, so the image of the holy and odd God will be lifted up for all to see. And those are the words of Mike Iaconelli. Praise be God. <laughs> but I love it. I love his honesty, especially speaking this more than 20 years ago. So on that note, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read a story that you, if you've been in church at any bit of time, are very familiar with this. Uh, I'm going to read this, but I'm going to ask you, after I read it the first time, to really focus on not Jesus in the scripture. <laughs> I want you to focus on the not Jesus characters in this story. Usually when we read it, it's all about Jesus in this. But I think that you're going to get my whole rant on oddness and why we need to embrace our own uniqueness here with this. So this is Luke, Luke 5, uh, starting on 17. One day Jesus, Jesus was preaching. The Pharisees and teachers of law were sitting there. They'd come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went to the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friends, your sins are forgiven. Now, I could go off on this because I love the story that Jesus' first reaction is to forgive their sins, even though that's not what they're even there for, that Jesus is baiting the religious people at times by doing this. And it is a beautiful story of that. But I'm going to read this a second time, and I want you to focus again on not Jesus, but the other people involved, the friends of this paralyzed man. I'm going to read this through a different translation, which may, may give you a little bit of richness to it, and it may not. Either way, listen again. This is through the Mirror Bible version of Luke 5. Then one day... While he was teaching, the following dramatic incident happened. There were Pharisees and scholars of the law also sitting in his audience, along with people coming from every village in Galilee and Judea, as well as the outskirts of Jerusalem. The very atmosphere was charged with the presence of the Lord to heal. Meanwhile, there, was, uh, there were people desperately trying to get into the house where Jesus was teaching. They were carrying a man on a bed who'd suffered from severe convulsions that had left him paralyzed. And if they only could get him close to Jesus to where Jesus was teaching, but they could not because of the crowd. Now, they finish in this first part that we're reading here, in Luke 5, 19. Then having no alternative, they got onto the roof and proceeded to break the roof open, taking the tiles off and then lowering him onto his bed exactly where Jesus was. Now in this story, we always get caught up in the fact of like, oh, they did anything to bring this man to Jesus. But let's, let's, look at, let's look at what they were looking at here, okay? Their friend had a problem, and he needed his problem to be fixed. They knew that there was this holy man, this healer that they had heard of, that, 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 that drew crowds and that preached about the kingdom of God. So in their minds, this guy heals people. We need to take our friend there because we want to fix his problem. We want to find a solution to a problem that he's having that is ailing him. They, they are being good friends, showing up in a posture that we eventually see Jesus blesses. But what they did is they needed to find a creative solution to a problem that someone they know was having. Now, when I tell you that I think a lot of Christianity is about us embracing our uniqueness and our oddness, I think that that we have that spirit in us. The Holy Spirit gives us those types of insights to be able to look out to say, who in our community is hurting? 
Who, 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 in my, who in my wheelhouse do I know needs help? Where can I be Jesus to someone else today? Now, we can get caught up like we did earlier in the hour about, oh, my right to say this, my right to do this. It's all about me and my preference. But really, when you go back into the make and mold of Jesus, it's pretty simple. You love others. You serve others. You act in grace. You are a servant to this world. That is, <laughs> that's core to the kingdom of God. Now, all the other junk we deal with on the show, yes, 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 we mock them, yes, we make fun of them, but they're all missing the point. They are, they are tragically missing the point because they're nowhere even near to the simple call of Christ to go and help people. And the simple story, their friends had a need. They showed up and they made it happen. See, I don't want to get caught up in calling all this stuff. Oh, there was miracles here happening and baptisms here. No, where did we show up and, and, and act as a lifesaver to someone? Even in small ways, even in small ways. Like where are those places that we are showing up and being Jesus to other people? Because I feel like that is one of the core, that is one of the core tenets of what it means to follow after Jesus. If we want to even say that that this should be one of the core tenets of Christianity, not what it looks like today, but that is the heartbeat of it. All of this secular versus sacred, all of this culture warring, what it does is it creates lines between us and the world that we are called to go and help and serve and love and make a better place. It, it puts a fence around us and tells us that place is dirty, don't go there. But if you know anything about the Jesus of the Bible, Jesus never said that's, don't, that's too dirty, don't go there. That's too secular, don't go there. Jesus always went there. He always went there. He always went to the place where the religious leaders would not go. He always went there. And Jesus was seen as odd. He confused his followers. He confused the power brokers of the time. So as we talk about this, I am going to tell you that you are called to be odd. You are called to be unique. You are called to be the person that you were born to be in whatever way that means. But just like Mike Yakinelli had said, you should know the truth and the truth should make you odd. Now what I give you, what I give you today my dear listener, is something that I want to just speak over you. To wherever you are at, you can make a difference. You can make a difference wherever you are at. You can be part of the kingdom of God where you're at by just doing those acts of kindness, doing those acts of servitude and love and grace and compassion. Because oftentimes when we, when we see in, in, in institutional Christianity, we have to be like this in order to go here. We've got to do this in order to go and serve. We have to do, be this in order to do this. No, no, no. God loves you exactly the way you are, exactly where you are at, with the thoughts you have in your head, with the things that you have in your mind that are around yourself. God knows who you are, and God loves you exactly where you are at. So you need to know this, that it is okay to feel what you feel. It is okay to doubt what you doubt. It is okay to question what you question. It is okay to seek what you seek. It is okay to give what you give. It is okay to take what you take. And in the end, be okay with who you are. Learn to be who you are. Because when you do that, when you own who you are, your uniqueness, your oddities, all of it, you're able to own it and go out and help free other people to see that spark of God that exists within them, to see that greatness that is within them, to restore their dignity, to tell them that they are good, that they are loved to tell them that God loves them, but at the same time, that we love them, that you love them. You love them enough to show up, to help, to make that kind of a difference. Because I believe in you. And I know that you, you have something very specific in your own space that God can use. So that's all I've got this hour. 
this broadcast and all past podcasts can be found at www.snarkyfaith.com or wherever else you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in getting some snarky swag, feel free. <laughs> go to snarkyfaith.com and look for the tab for swag. You may go and get that. And as I leave you, I'm going to leave you. We always do our, our little liturgy at the end. I'm going to add something to this. And this comes from a song called Hearts on Fire by Scars on 45. And, and this has been something I, I was thinking about all day today. Uh, and there's, there's just, there's a refrain in the song that says this, when you're standing on your own and you feel that you've got nobody around you, yeah, you know, I'll be the one who helps you from your knees. Now, I could easily over-spiritualize that and say, God will help you when you are in those hard times. But that is an abstract statement. And at times that is comforting, but most times it's also not. So here's what I'll offer you. If anyone needs to talk, if anyone needs a conversation, if anyone needs some encouragement, if anyone needs to unload questions at snarkyfaith.com, it goes straight to my email. <laughs> so if you want to talk to me directly, let's have a conversation. Because I believe in you. I think that maybe all you need to do is help have someone help you get up in order for you to go and help other people. That's all I've got this hour. And as I do every week, I send you out and release you into the wild, wide world with the holiest amount of grace and peace and snark. Go out and be the difference in someone's life this week. Go out and be Jesus to someone. That's all I've got. I'm out of here. Peace. you're still hanging around after the show, still hanging around, I've got one little bit, one little bit of Christian crazy left for you, if you're in the mood for it. We only have him on here every once in a while, but this is big boy pants pastor Todd Cochinato. Now, I call him that because Todd always kind of talks like he's a big boy. He's got his pull-up pants on, and he's ready to be a man of God talking about thoughts he had in his little brain. And it's always, it's always great to watch this because it does. It sounds like you're listening to like a little like tough talking five-year-old that's just coming from the backyard. Like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And meow, 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 meow. That is the essence of Todd. And it is beautiful when you get to see that fat little hamster running around on the wheel to power Todd's little brain. But you can watch it happen. And it's beautiful. Todd has prophetic words here. He has lots of words. Do they make sense? Do they make sentences? Is there an answer to all this? Not really, but you can see him or listen to him here trying his little hardest. Oh, bless his little heart. Listen, you can run on for a long time. You can run on for a long time, but sooner or later, God's going to cut you down. And listen out there to the pedophiles, to the Satanists, to the people out there. Seriously, like why is pedophile everyone's number one go-to for evil people? Like in the religious right. Why is it that's like, like, I feel like I don't think anyone should want to have the word pedophile on the tip of their tongue at any point. But they always kind of seem to. That's like the Trump card they keep pulling out. Pedophile! Like, what is a pedophile for 200, Alex? Huh? Sorry, sorry. Todd was being a big boy. Let me finish him being a big boy. I just find that part odd. And, and you'll, you can mock me all you want. You can tell me I'm crazy, I'm a conspiracy guy, or play the sound bite. Oh, there's Pastor Todd again. You know what? Honestly, I believe this with all of my heart. You can make fun of me all you want. I'm going to stand before the King of Kings. I'm going to stand before the Lord of Lords. I don't care about what you think about me. I don't care if you think I'm a conspiracy theorist or whatever name that you want to call me. Because I know that God is real and you can run on for a long time. But sooner or later, God is going to cut you down. And I'm telling every single person out there that thinks that they can mess with the church. Every single person out there that wants to close down the church. Every single person out there that wants to make fun of the saints. Every person out there 
that wants to, to mock us and to mock our God, the God of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You better watch out because God says, do not touch my church. Do not touch my church. And I wasn't expecting to get this word, but hallelujah, I believe the Lord has dropped this word right now. Maybe somebody needs to hear this that's listening to this. God said, do not touch my church. If you touch my church, you are going to get burned. Hallelujah. Those people that have tried to shut down the church with their wicked plots and their wicked schemes and all their nefarious plans, you are going to get shut down. You are the one. This is going to come back around on you. You think we are on the losing side? Well, you better look at history because we have never lost not one single time. That's who we are in Jesus Christ. We are victorious.